The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. I'd like to introduce Mr. Andrew Saltis, a uh, software engineer for Akamai Incorporated. Pesaltis. Pesaltis, I'm sorry. I, I, we know him on IRC by his uh, chemical formula, but uh, anyway, Andrew is a good speaker and a good, um, good friend and, uh, and also a good shot with his Nerf gun, so watch out. And for reference, it's, uh, it's right here. Okay, so I am going to, I, as was just said, I am Andrew Persaltis, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about making pointers point in reference to um, pointers, one of the very common things in C. I have slides like those. So um, first things first, it would be a little bit about C, since um, maybe not all of you know it. Actually, for you, how many of you actually do know C? Most of you, as expected. How many people have taken a uh, computer architecture class at some point? About the same. Okay. Well, I'm going to be getting into a little bit about C. I'm going to be taking, getting into a little about computer architecture. It's going to be uh, probably going to sound like a bunch of college lectures smashed together. Unfortunately, a lot of this stuff is kind of academic, and it can't really be avoided. I'll try to make it funny when I can. So um, C, C was a programming language written by a dude named Dennis Ritchie at Bell Labs in the late 60s and early 70s. He did a lot of other things too, and like chunks of Unix, if not all of it. And um, it's very old and it's still around today because it is very easy to take C code and convert it into computer machine instructions since most of that is just about doing math and computing memory address offsets. Most of C is somehow an encapsulation of doing math and computing memory address offsets. Because of, it, because of the ease of conversion between it and machine language instructions, it is very fast, and thus a lot of performant, uh, performance uh, applications are written, to it, written with it, such as OpenSSL, networking daemons, other programming languages, and this is just really, really common. In fact, a lot of mo many programming languages use C to bind, or use C as a binding language, say you need to make a, make a foreign function call. It almost always goes to C. It's like a universal barrier of sorts. All right, get that out of the way. Let's ask a little question. What's a pointer? Well, um, an example of a pointer would be it would look better if the colors weren't inverted. But uh, it's a pointer such as this. It points, or would point. So it's kind of ghostly, but that's supposed to be a, a pointer dog. I have this pointer here. I'm going to go point at the pointer. So it, it's all pointing. It's all pointing all the way down. So. Um, Let's give you a little better answer here. A uh, pointer is a value, in most often cases, an integer that contains a memory address that points to another value. Um, for the, for the uh, person who first sees that explanation the first time, it just doesn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to me. So I was thinking like, so how many of you don't know what pointers already were before I came in here? Okay. So um, generally, it's, that is not a useful answer, so I'm just going to, I'm going to be explaining more about that later. But first, let's uh, get into a little outline here. I'm going to be talking to a little bit, thinking a little bit of about computer memory, um, getting into the meat of things, like point, exactly what pointers are as an explanation that you already know. Um, generally, how um, some schemes of memory allocation and uh, other ways to do it other than the two main ones and uh, some resources and details. So, uh, you know, I didn't, you know, I wasn't planning on having to invert the color, so everything looks really, really ghostly. <laughs> so, um, typically when one thinks of memory, one inevitably goes and thinks of just RAM. 
however, it's a lot more complicated. It's a bit more complicated than that. However, it's still a big chunk of it. So um, first things, let's get down to a word here. A com whenever you hear, start dealing with uh, the complexities of memory, you always you start hearing the word locality. And it means when you have a, you have a word, if you were to access a point in memory, you are going, you are likely to do access that same point in memory again in the near future, and also the stuff around it in the near future. This makes sense. This would be useful if you just go instead of pulling just a single chunk of stuff you need off of disk. Instead, you just pull a larger chunk of it because you will almost certainly use the stuff around it in the near future. Say you're not going to say if you have a program, there, you have a program, you don't want to just load the individual instructions one at a time. It would take forever. So you just load uh, chunks of the program, because uh, it's usually uh, done in what's called pages. And uh, leads us to this, this little handy dandy thing everyone likes to call memory hierarchy. This is, in, this is often in operating systems and computer architecture textbooks. So what, how this is laid out is that often you start from everything is on disk of some sort, like law. Uh, large persistent storage. It moves up into less persistent storage that gets smaller as it goes all the way up. Uh, what gets, he's getting, it's, so uh, as you get further up, uh, capacity goes down significantly. So uh, uh, disk can be, these days, can be consist of hundreds of gigabytes to terabytes. RAM is gigabytes. Uh, cache is usually start, you're starting getting to the kilobytes range. And when you get to the CPU registers, you are usually only limited to a, uh, a relatively small number of bytes. You, gen you almost certainly cannot fit a full program into the registers. S and registers aren't also aren't persistent storage. So everything, you have to get everything from the disk and get it into the registers so that the CPU can go and twiddle the bits and do math and all the stuff that CPUs are uh, ought to do. And else here? Yeah, so um, the term actual memory could be in actually many places. So so uh, in Linux you often have a uh, swap file. So you could have memory. You could have memory on. Actually, random memory on the disk. You can have memory in here, memory in here. This is all uh, made so it is transparent to the user applications, because that, as you could probably guess, that is a very messy subject. So these days, every we all let the operating system kernel do it, and it is done often using a scheme called virtual memory. So, um, what if you have a lot of, in addition to um, having the process of getting information from disk and moving it up to the CPU. You also have to worry about the fact that there are other things running on, that other things that need to be running on that CPU. Uh, CPUs are time shared. You can't just, you just can't, so you can't just make assumptions about what memory is being used by each application. You can't, or rather you can't set that initially in the application because you don't necessarily know what the memory usage is going to be at runtime, you can never, you can never really tell that in general. So what happened? So what is d assumed is that the uh, operating system this, or the program assumes that it has all the memory available in the world to it. You can take whatever it can take. So like it has the full addressable space of memory. In the case of 32-bit systems, this is uh, four gigabytes up to two to 32. Um, on 64-bit systems, it is. Uh, to the 64, which is um, actually more, uh, yeah, more memory than you can generally put into a computer these days, or a single computer these days. So um, there are times when you have, like the physical memory can be of a different size, say, um, say if you have running a 32-bit system with only four gigabytes of memory, then you would, in Linux, you would generally have a swap partition. So you would, so you'd actually have more memory available than just the four gigabytes that would be available to the application. And thus, when the application requests, requests its memory, it is up to the operating system to go and give it the memory. 
So it might, and it also might not necessarily be a direct mapping into, you're saying something? Might not necessarily be a uh, direct mapping. It might not be, the, the visual virtual memory address might not be the same as the address in physical memory. For example, it might be in swap, like this block down here might be in, might be in swap, might be a different part of disk. It's a job of the operating system and with some hardware assistance to um, be able to map virtual addresses to physical addresses. It's also, and as a side effect of this, it makes application com makes compiling applications uh, much simpler. You don't have to worry about uh, any any absolute memory addresses. Everything is done relative to uh, a, uh, a a value in another register, which is called a well, stack pointer, which brings us to this. Uh, we have a they're typically you uh, allocate memory. Memory is allocated in applications in two ways, statically, which is done as a part of program execution. Uh, if you say you want an integer value x, if you go and say int x equals 42, you would go and that value 42 would be put on the stack above the uh, current function call. Uh, and if, yeah, it's called the stack for reasons, actually, the data structure really kind of resembles a stack. I can get into that later, but it's also, it's also kind of complicated. and. Uh, also, dynamic allocation. Uh, dynamic allocation. Uh, in this case, it is allocated as a part of uh, requests to the operating system. Um, these are done usually using system calls. This goes onto the heap. Uh, the heap is not is like is not necessarily contiguous. You could just say, "I need a point. I need a. Uh, I need 16 bytes of. You ask the kernel using a function. I need 16 bytes of space, and it says, and it either gives you back 16 bytes of space or it says, "No, you do not have 16 bytes of space." I do not have 16 bytes of space available to you, so I will return you a value indicating that is the case. In this case, that is the value zero. So one thing that is a relatively common thing that happens. So um, these addresses are, uh, are mapped, in, mapped using offsets. So it is possible in C, since there isn't necessarily any bounds checking, that you could access memory, say, here. And you might not necessarily, your application might necessarily be able to ac allow to access memory here. And what when the what happens there is a uh, when in Unix land that is generally what causes a segmentation fault. Uh, accessing protected memory that is not for your mentor application. It's uh, for help. It's for security and I'd actually say mostly sanity reasons. Uh, also, another common segmentation fault cause is accessing uh, the uh, null pointer itself that is reserved by the uh, operating system kernel. Dereferencing that, there's never anything at that. You are never allowed to access it. So uh, your program will, program will always die, you would, somewhat spectacularly, actually. You can always do also set up signal handler so your program doesn't die so suddenly and spectacularly so it doesn't, so you can at least recover something before you fall over. But this is generally a uh, fatal condition. All right, so let's get into the meat of things. Um, okay, so let's go for the question again, what's a pointer? So um, say we have this value here, this value is Say you have integer x, you're taking it 15. Uh, this down here is, the, is a hexadecimal decimal representation of how it might be stored in memory. Uh, this is big endian. If on uh, other machines, it's the, the order of these blocks would be flipped. So um, in general, for uh, the case of just, just uh, diagramming it out, it doesn't really matter what the order is. So um, you have this value, right? This value has got to be somewhere. It's got to sit somewhere in memory, right? So let's just say it, uh, it's at four giggles, address 64. It starts at 64. So this byte containing zeros is 64. This one's at 65. This one's at 66. This one's at 67. Uh, in sense, integers, integers uh, generally take up in 32-bit systems four bytes. That is, that is x. x is X is at 64 and goes until 67. So um, the uh, this case is that said, where is it? There is uh, clearly a bunch. There's clearly a bunch of numbers above the other numbers. 
So um, it is at the value 64. So it, there's this other integer size value here. This is 64, hexadecimal 64. And uh, yeah, that is actually pretty much it. It just is the value that points at the start of the object you're looking for. Question. Yes, sir. Question. Does it all, do pointers always point at the most significant or least significant, or does it vary? Um, this is the question was, do pointers uh, point to the most significant or, or the least significant? I uh, believe, I'm not completely sure about this, it points to the start. For what was depending on a system endianness, like the most significant bit in some systems would be or byte would be here. In other cases, it would be here. Okay, so it's pointing at the lowest value of the data set. Yes, it is pointing at the lowest value of the data set because if you would, because as I'll get to later, you can have stuff behind this that can just get bigger. So you would want, so it just be stuff behind it. So you need to point at the start. I made a little, if anyone gets that joke at the top there, uh, they watch too much Star Trek. <laughs> Yeah, Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. Uh, so let's get into a little bit of code. So um, say, so just a general use case of pointers or how to get stuff out of them. Uh, say you have an integer x, you declare it to the value 42. Um, in some cases you will want to make a pointer to the value x. So to do this, you use the, uh, use, this is the, this unary ampersand here is the, uh, is the reference operator. You're taking the reference of x, the pointer to x, and then you declare it as int star xp for, uh, in this case, I just named it as the pointer to x. And in a lot of cases, you won't necessarily even need to say, x if you were pass passing the pointer to a function, you wouldn't necessarily even need to say xp, you would just pass that into the function. It's just an integer, it's small, it, it's cheap. So oh, and what the and the thing the real use case of pointers is that you can go say you have a pointer to a value, you want to go and uh, set you want to change something at that pointer. So in this so here you would set the you would set the dereference value of xp to 100. So since x since xp was pointing to x, you change also change the value of x. I will. I'm going to give a slight demonstration, a brief demonstration of that shortly. So, um, and also you can go and refer, you can also go and dereference the, de -reference the uh, values of pointers and store them directly. So you have, you can say int x2 is xp, is the reference value of xp, the reference operator being the asterisk, and rather dereference operator being the asterisk. Carry on from there. So I have a little example here. So uh, can you all read this? Do I need to make the uh, font any bigger? Okay. So um, you start out with uh, integer direct equals 42. Um, before, you know, print statement saying before, I take the pointer to x, set the, and I set the value of the thing pointed at by xp, which is x to 100. And then, uh, I, do, then I do some more printing. So, uh, And for, let's say what the program is. So just as, any trouble reading that? Or should I go and, I can go and flip the colors here too. Okay. So as I said, the value is initially set to 42, and then I set the reference value to 100, and then it both show up as 100. Um, because of this, what if you the pointers are often used in C functions as arguments? If so, if you pass a pointer to a function, sometimes the uh, sometimes the function might go and change the value associated with that pointer. It might set something in or at that pointer, and this would persist outside of the function call. Since in general, uh, things in C don't blast outside of function calls, so it's, this is a way of uh, making in place. In place changes to um, various ob to uh, objects in C. 
Um, there are other, most often you wouldn't necessarily pass integers like that as pointers. You would pass the things called structs, which are uh, aggregate types. Um, I can go uh, discuss those a little more later if we get some time, but uh, it's fundamentally the same sort of thing. So um, as just a nice summary here, we have a, uh, it's just that the, you given the pointer, the asterisk operator gets you the value, the ampersand operator on this gives you the pointer, op gives you back the pointer. And you can actually call this many times. You can get the, so once you have, if you have this is value stored memory, you can get a pointer to this too. And it might, and it also could just be anywhere. And uh, I think how that come, I'll get to that in a moment actually. So uh, one of the things that people will see when they're writing C code is uh, where the asterisk goes regarding in the, uh, when you're making pointers. I, or I gave this away early by doing it all like this, but this kind of makes sense, right? You're saying it's, you're making the type as an int pointer. Right, um, that's not how C does it, because you can do things like that. You have, in order if you say you, the, the asterisk is bound to the variable it is next to. So you can't, so if you put a star with int, it would only make this X a pointer here. If that wasn't there, just Y would be an integer, plain old integer instead. So as I was, just, I just came back here. So you can have pointers to pointers to pointers. Pointers all the way down. So um, say you can have a pointer to, if it x 42, you can make a pointer to, you can make a pointer to x, you can make a pointer to xp, you can make a pointer to xppp, and then you can dereference them. You can dereference them dereference three times and get back the original value of 42. The, uh, so you might be wondering, why can't we uh, just put three ampersands there? Why can't we just uh, have a, uh, you, you can't stack the, you, you, why can't we stack the ampersands? You cannot stack the ampersands because uh, this, this operator returns a number. And if you have a number, the numbers are just, are not necessarily in memory yet. They're not being saved anywhere. Uh, if you uh, do, sorry, if you start stacking ampersands next to each other, uh, the GCC will actually spit out an error saying you can't take a, you can't, uh, take a reference of a number. It has, it has to be a value known, has to be a value stored in memory somewhere. So in this case, it would just be, in this case is just making, I'm referencing XP, which is a pointer to X, but is itself an object in memory. This is one of the things that threw me off a bit. Uh, it makes like uh, often people will describe a metaphor for uh, pointers as addresses, except the addresses themselves are just but where are the but the addresses can be somewhere too. Um, so I can uh, I can give you a little metaphor actually. Yeah, I have time for that. So um, say you're looking for your car keys. You think you left your you have a note on your bedside table saying you left your car keys by the front door. So you walk to your front door, you find a little posted note saying. Oh yeah, no, your car keys weren't aren't here. They're in the refrigerator. So you go to your refrigerator, you look inside, you find another sticky note saying, Oh yeah, um you your, your car keys aren't here. You should go look on your uh, dining room table instead. So you walk to your dining room table and lo and behold, there are your car keys. That in this case, that is a point that is a, a two-nested pointer, and we are referencing and referencing, or dereferencing it until we get to the value in question. So every is, everything is just pointing things, you're pointing at things until you get to the value you're looking for. So uh, one thing you also may notice is that all these pointers have uh, associated types. So in this case, uh, we all have, like these are all integer pointers or integer pointer pointers or pointer pointer pointers. So um, when you have, uh, sometimes you have a need for a generic pointer, you just need a pointer to some sort of space. Uh, this is actually very important. So um, you make it, so if you need, if you, if you need a typeless pointer, say you have a function call that, you have a, you have a function callback that needs to uh, take a generic argument, just say a bunch of opaque data that only the 
callback function would know about, you would pass it as a void pointer because you don't know what the type is, it's just data. There's a, there's a very important function that uses void pointers, I'll get to that soon. Another thing you can do with uh, pointers is that you can have stuff behind pointers. So you can have a, so um, the thing about C is that there are C strings are in fact um, arrays or pointers at things. So um, in this case, the this case the string pointer here is just the is just this little just that those sequence of uh, set eight characters. Uh, you have to have the uh, that null terminator on that that uh, thing on the end there. The backslash zero is uh, was called a null terminator. Is uh, the way that C knows that this string is done. This bit string, or in this case, this character string is done here. Uh, without it, C, uh, there, without it, there you would not be able to know where this string ends unless you had a uh, associated length with it. There is no bounce. There is no bounce checking in C unless you explicitly added it. So um, if so, there, there's a function say called there's a function called strlen which gets us the length of the string. So it does. It goes and starts here and then goes all the way until it finds this and says your string is length seven as it goes from zero to six. And if, it, if this isn't here, it would keep on going until it started accessing memory your application was not allowed to access, or it might start accessing memory of your, of your application that is not in the string, which is, you can do all sorts of funny things if you could do that. And it would go and access memory and your program would uh, explode with signal 11 and die violently. These are also what is generally called arrays. There is a, another C thing C called an array. I will get to that soon. Um, so when you have, say you need to allocate a, when you get to memory allocation, you have to get to a, you have to figure out how large things are because you need, when you need to allocate a specific number of bytes for a specific number, for a specific number of things. So to get, so to get the uh, number, the how large things are, typically you would use the size of operator. It just goes and it goes and happens to know ahead of time exactly what the size of things are, the size of types are rather, before at compile time. So it just translates that to a integer and then uh, unsigned, unsigned integer. And um, just pretty from there. Um, Give you an example of that. Well, I'll show an example of that soon. And then yet another thing you can do with pointers that you can add to them. So, um, or you can do arithmetic with. You can you can add and add and subtract. You can't multiply. It doesn't make any sense. I'll tell you why. So, um, say you make a string called pointer as previous before. So um, here I have, I have two print functions. This one here is printing out the a character followed by the pointer value. So I'm dereferencing I'm dereferencing s since s is the only s is the pointer to the first value of the string first character in the string, it will undoubtedly return p, the capital P. However, in the next one, I'm doing the same thing but I'm adding 2 to all of the values. This is a different what different here is that when you give uh, we do arithmetic with pointers. It will advance the pointer, the uh, size of the uh, value in question. So in this case, this will advance, go two elements forward in the uh, string to the i, and print that out instead. Print that out too. If this was say an integer array, instead of advancing, uh, advancing uh, just two bytes since a character is one byte, it would advance uh, eight bytes since an integer in 32-bit land is four bytes. So I have this example two. Uh, yeah. So I have the, I just have some, there's the program, it's the same except it has some comments that pretty much has said exactly what I uh, discussed and Bam, just as I said it would. So um, it's printing out the P followed by the pointer to the P, which is uh, at the start of the string at some address uh, determined by, by uh, the kernel and the program. And then it advanced two forward, uh, 
this is, these are all hexadecimal values, so C plus, so it goes from 0 to 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then back to 1, 0 again. It's uh, base 16. I should have said that first. So um, C plus 2 equals E. It advanced two positions forward as uh, expected. So um, when you just look at S, if you just have a function that just contains this random S, you don't necessarily know what S is. Um, so say S, you have this big function, you don't know what S is. S, so you're just, so you're just adding to S. Like, okay, you're adding a number to S. I, I, there are other clues that give away that's a pointer, but this is kind, it's, this is kind of makes things hard to read. So there's a specific operator, there's a, there is an operator that specifically does this. And it is the, what's called the array, array to reference operator. So in this case, this is the um, square brackets of old. Um, if it, uh, it does the, does the exact same thing as dereferencing the pointer plus an offset. So if S, so this is equivalent to uh, S, the referencing the value of S plus zero, which is, ex, which is the uh, array index here. It's, and these actually, produ actually produce of the, pretty much the precise, the exact same program when output. So, So there's that. Uh, there's the same program again with the same information, and I can't type. So um, these values. So it's the same results, and actually, in fact, it's the exact same results as is, as you can see in the top there. So it's. Very much the same code. Um, there's a way, if you want to examine this further, there is a uh, mode for GCC that can print out the assembly code. It is uh, this, and then the file name. It'll just uh, print, it'll uh, print out a, it'll write a file call, it'll print out a .s file instead of a a.out file or whatever the heck you wanted to call it. And then you can use it to study the, study the assembly code and figure out precisely what it's doing. Um, one thing to know is that in like a lot of uh, textbooks on the subject, you won't see a lot of uh, a lot of the code you'll see is either done in MIPS or 32-bit x86. These days, in a lot of systems, the default the default uh, defaults to compiling 64-bit x86, which is much more complicated than the than its 32-bit predecessor. So, or and yeah, predecessor. So. Uh, and to do that, you would have to make sure you have a 32-bit 30 30 compiler support around and do M30, M32 on the end to make sure it compiles to 32-bit. Just for starting purposes, the code, sh the code should be equivalent, otherwise the compiler, or functionally equivalent, otherwise the compiler is broken, and that's really bad. And the uh, system is, is a useful study aid. That's a uh, way it was put to me when I learned this stuff. So as I said in like three times, those two are the same thing. The dereferencing, the array dereference is the same as a, array dereference is the same as a, or array at the, array dereference is the same as dereferencing the pointer and adding the offset to it using our friend pointer arithmetic. There are plenty of use cases for pointer arithmetic. They're just generally more advanced. Uh, you'll, if you need them, you will, you, need it, you will, in, if you need it, you'll probably know it. If you need to like advance more than just one position in the array, you would need to use a pointer arithmetic. If you're, if you're doing, if you're just visiting the individual elements of the array one at a time, as opposed to just iterating through the array. And there are some use cases for that. So um, another thing is that there is, as I mentioned before, there is a difference between arrays and pointers. So um, typically uh, arrays like this refer to uh, just are used like buffers. These are 
these are generally put on these you would generally you put a number in here specifying the size and this would go and uh, be there would be a say you put four in there you would have an you would have a space for four integers on the stack ready for use pre-allocated just take them take it and run with it when you have a pointer however the pointer is uh, not initial is just a pointer it's an integer when you when you set when you create variables in C you need to set them to something otherwise they will point off into space or sort of some random value that is likely not a part of your program. So if you try to dereference a pointer that you just made by saying in star x, it's most like it's more most likely going to cause a segmentation fault. So um, you often need to have that actually point at something either by dereferencing a value or allocating memory to it. So um, that is something that's going to be coming up right now. Let's talk about arrays first. So as I said, you could have a uh, arrays, you can create arrays that are uninitialized with a uh, value of four. Say if you want a space for four ints, that's uninitialized, you want to set them later, you would go and do something like this. If you wanted a uh, array with pre-initialized values, if you, if you have an initial value set, you can go and uh, set this to you can, see, you can set initial values by using this uh, handy dandy little bracket notation there. Um, typically, once you make them, you would do something with them. You would, excuse me, pass them to other functions. And once you leave the function, they are uh, effectively free. You do not have to worry about doing any memory, any complex memory management tasks with things on the stack. Once you leave the function, they are, uh, they are gone, effectively. They're, they're still in memory, but they are not really accessible anymore. It's, uh, it's uh, as they say, popping off the stack. If I, I can get into more detail about that at the end, there, that is plenty well documented. So let's get to dynamic allocation. Everyone's favorite part of everyone's favorite part of C is dynamically allocating variable memory. So um, you would have there are two functions that are typically used for this. There are actually more than just these two, but they each serve their own. They each have their own little use. If you look up, if you look up one, they all start referencing all the other ones. So um, the two big ones are malloc and free. Malloc or memory allocate is uh, you give it a byte, you give it a number of bytes, and it and it asks the kernel give me give me a memory space for this many bytes, and then it will give you a pointer to that space. Since this, since you can't, it can't know what you're going to be using it for beforehand. This will return a void pointer, and you would have to cast it implicitly or otherwise to the actual type you would need to use it for. And um, free frees that memory. Uh, why do we need to have free here? So um, when you make a request to the kernel to allocate memory, um, that and um, so it just gives you the memory. It's like okay, you want your you threat you program I process ID blah 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 want this amount of memory okay I will give it to you then except it is not the kernel doesn't really track how that memory is really being used it's just saying it's saying that the application owns it so if you happen to lose the pointer to that memory that it'll, the kernel will still think that it is allocated and is being used so if you happen to make many calls to uh, malloc without freeing them, say if you have a, a as if you have a long running program that doesn't that goes just creates a that sets up a bunch of resources and then doesn't doesn't deallocate them all at the right time, you will have, you will have a problem that is uh, commonly referred to as a memory leak. And uh, these are these can often be very, very hard to find. There are specialized tools such as Valgrind, one called Valgrind, that can go and uh, figure that can go and uh, help detect those memory leaks. Sometimes these can be really, really small. So you won't even really notice them until your program's been running for, uh, say, days. And um, in some cases, it's actually more economical to just re restart, the, restart the server as opposed to having to, or as opposed to fixing the leak. Say if you're writing, uh, dealing with a lot of a uh, Perl. 
Perl and C bindings. Sometimes it's, it's very possible to go and just create references and then lose them if you don't correctly track them. So as an example, uh, to use malloc, malloc is in the C standard library header. You have to allow that for the function to be available. Then you go and uh, create, a, create the pointer that with the, with, that is allocated to the, this is pretty much the same as the uh, first, as the example with the array, first example with the arrays with X where you just allocated a bunch, or just made an array with a bunch of empty space. So this would make a space for memory that is the size of four integers. So you could go and do, uh, do you can dereference it, you can pass it to a function, you can do whatever to it. Uh, commonly what people, so what some people will do is that they will go and have a, they'll have functions that go and call malloc and just malloc, call malloc, give you a populate a bunch of, populate a bunch of uh, space memory with values, and then return the pointer to them. And then it then, as this is the only way for pointers to um, really survive function calls, or rather memory to survive. You have pointers to mem values to survive between functions that you have, you keep track of the memory address where of where they are. If uh, values on the uh, stack are effectively lost, on, lost when the function call leaves, this does not happen, and thus leads to all the uh, memory leaking problems. And the free at the end is, uh, just as an example, if you're just doing this in main, and just ending right there, you don't need it. It's just a good practice to get into, because if you forget even one, it could cause uh, big problems down the line. So um, I want to get into a little bit of, uh, getting towards the end here, so I can get into a little bit of other ways some people about, um, handle memory. Uh, I was originally planning to talk about garbage, a little bit of garbage collection here. It's a rather complicated topic. So if I get some time at the end, I probably will. I can go and discuss that a little bit. But first off, um, region-based allocation. So, so um, you have a problem where you have uh, many things you need to know, you just need to keep track of them all and then free them all. Uh, create memory object, many objects and then free them all. Um, what happened, well, some ways some people solve this problem is that they go and have a, they have a data, they make a data structure that uh, contains a uh, list of pointers that have been allocated, associated with this object. And this, uh, the case of Apache, the Apache portable runtime library, which is which the Apache web server uses heavily, uh, this is called a memory pool. And uh, although this is not, it's not exactly what a memory pool is, that's also rather complicated. Um, you just go, you just go and make a pool. You allocate stuff to the pool. Then we're done with the pool. You call a function on the pool that goes and uh, delete that frees all the memory, the, frees all the memory associated with the pool, and then destroys the pool. Pretty much it. It's uh, it's uh, nice and simple and gets the job done. Um, some people would argue that it's not worth dealing with if you just happen if it can just solve the human. If you can have a if the human got everything right the first time, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, I'm sure there are other reasons for this. Uh, I'm not completely aware of them at this time. So um, another way people handle memory is like so you have a problem where you have many resources accessed at the uh, same time. So you have uh, so you have so you have many threads accessing the same bit of memory, and then threads occasionally die and get brought up again. And they all are accessing the same shared resource. At some point, you need to know when that resource can be safely deallocated because if you deallocate the resource too early and try to use it again, that will cause um, death, destruction, war, and horror. Um, if you also, if you happen to deallocate, if you happen to free the same thing twice, that also gives that causes actually the kernel to spit out some very interesting messages. Double double freeze are also bad, and that's also a considered a fatal condition. So what you do is that you have a, uh, associated with your pointer to whatever, uh, you have a, uh, you have a, just a number. A number keeps track of how many times this object is being used. And, at, and then when the, uh, when the reference, it's just the reference count. And when this gets to, uh, value gets down to zero, it is considered safe to be freed and often is done so. Um, this is actually how, like, I've, uh, if you ever look at how look at Python C bindings, they uh, have reference counted pointers 
inside Python that can be used to uh, track C objects if you need to do that sort of thing, need to need opaque Python objects. That's a moderately common use case, I believe. So um, now we're at the end, or near the end. We're gonna have some time for questions and garbage collection if you wanna hear it. So um, since this is a uh, very complicated topic, um, there are many books written on it. So um, first one, a computer, this is, this is a, a typical computer architecture textbook, computer organization design. Uh, it's not the third edition anymore, it's like maybe the fifth one, fifth edition. Uh, this contains a lot of uh, information on how uh, computers will compute, how things that get from memory into the processor, how processors are kind of, our processor are laid out, mem the memory hierarchy sort of thing. Um, it's mostly based on the uh, instruction set called MIPS. Um, the last thing I remember being used on that was common was the PlayStation 2. But as compared to uh, x86, the thir even 32-bit x86, it's much easier to understand. There are, and there are many emulators for it. The um, common one's called SPIM. And operating systems. Uh, the common book for that is uh, it's called the Dinosaur Book. It has dinosaurs on it. Every single edition of it has dinosaurs on the cover for no uh, known reason. And this is uh, this contains suffering about how uh, operating systems do their thing, like virtual memory, even some stuff about uh, the memory hierarchy, file I/O, thread locking, context switching, that sort of thing. Um, the, one of the authors of this book, uh, Silvershots, uh, also made a book. Also does a database, one of the common databases book. And that also inexplicably also has always has sailboats on the cover, so it's always called the sailboat book. Some random trivia. Um, also, if you happen to um, feel inclined to um, read more about processors, there's this book. I didn't really read too much into it, but it's uh, it's much more low low level than the operating system, the higher level operating systems book or a uh, uh, computer general computer architecture book. Um, for uh, functions, if you need to figure out how a function, a uh, particular remember, like C, a C function works, often these are documented in man pages under section three of the, or actually, I'm not sure exactly what that's called, but just uh, part three of the man pages directory. If you go, if you uh, just type in man free in there, it will go, it searching, searches up through the numbers in the man pages directory, and the first thing it will find is the program free. That is uh, not what you're looking for, so you have to specify three there to get to free. Um, like all the standard C library functions are documented in there in some way or shape or form. It also gives you caveats and a lot of times use cases. And furthermore, um, this is a topic that is uh, people, many people have asked questions about. So if you start, if you have a problem and you need to figure, and you have a question for it, there's almost certainly, almost certainly someone has asked that question on Stack Overflow before or say in some other form. So you can go and look that up and get uh, some pretty, actually very, ela very uh, elaborate answers written by people. Actually, it's quite impressive. Actually, it's better, some, better than some of the stuff I've said here. So um, that's all I got for you. So um, I can answer questions. I can talk a little bit about uh, garbage collection or garbage street folks. All right, I have about 10 minutes, right? So I'll go, let's go and talk a little about garbage collection. So, um, no, no, go back. No, go back, I don't want that. So, Problem is when you have a lot of uh, when you have a lot of programming language uh, when you have a lot of a lot of stuff handling memory is hard and complicated. So these days, a lot of languages have uh, stuff built in that goes and keeps track of all of the memory that's being used in the process. So um, I think you might have a say. This is your uh, heap memory. This is your this is the dynamic memory of all the stuff you've. Uh, uh, malloced, for example. And then you have all this other stuff. This is your uh, stack and your registers where all the known values are in the, uh, where all the, pro all the values you're currently 
know about or can access. So um, there's a lot of stuff in here. So say you scan all of these and you find out that you can access this one and this one. It means they are somehow guaranteed that they're somehow do they're somehow still in use. So um, you just go look at all this other space and it's like, oh wait, I don't need to hold on to this anymore. So it can go and uh, deallocate them if it wanted to. Generally, it doesn't actually deallocate them. What it does is that it just sets the it just sets the memory as unused. And if you need to access it, if you need say say you are calling a function that makes a lot of uh, arrays to uh, makes a lot of uh, lists of uh, objects, and you, they are all approx they're all like the same. So you're always using a 16, six, you're always using 16 of the same thing, and you're always deallocating. You're always you don't need it anymore. It would just go and it could go and use this block of memory again and not have to worry about requesting it from the kernel. Just um, recycle, recycle space. Um, there's a, you know, some, people, some people call this the uh, memory allocator, not allocator. Like I've seen like, sometimes I've seen applications just go, I just go into take up memory and they just like stay at a particular usage of memory after a long period of time. This might be what, this might be what they're doing here. Um, this is, uh, in general, the what, uh, garbage collector for C, written by a guy named, I think this is how you spell it, Hans Bohm, I think, is that how you spell it? Is it Bohm? Yeah. So this guy wrote a garbage collector for C. It's pretty complicated. It works on a similar principle to this. It sweeps, it marks stuff in memory that is in, that is in use goes through the heap, then sweeps for values that it can, it believes it can no longer access. It does this uh, it, by finding values that it thinks look like pointers. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it does this. Uh, I had slides originally, originally set up, but the explanation of how it worked was uh, black magic. It might as well be. And uh, these, days, if you actually, these days, if you actually wanted garbage collection, you would use a uh, language that supported it natively and not have to worry about all this other complex stuff. Another, sometimes you can use the uh, uh, Boehm or Boehm garbage collector as a, a memory leak checking tool. And that's uh, also, uh, that they also document how to use it as that. So I never actually tried, use, tried using it because I haven't had any, any real big applications for that where memory leaks were a, ended up being a problem. So that's something to, something to um, consider. Yeah. All right, uh, I have five minutes. Is there any questions, comments, concerns? Yes? So you mentioned uh, Valgrind as a debugging tool. What other like, practical applications have you run across to do this? Do you, do you run into programs that exist, or are you writing this from scratch? Uh, the question was, what are my use cases for um, Valgrind, or using a, like a memory leak debugger? Often, this thing just gets, I haven't actually used it myself yet. I just know that it, actually I used it like once and I never, and that was just to figure out the memory usage of an application. I just know it exists. I know a lot of people use it. Um, typically, it's used for big things that run for a lot of time. So presumably it would already exist. It would already exist. You need to track it and you just need to track it and through a period of execution or something like that just to, Theory. I, I haven't had to, I either have been good enough not to create any memory leaks or I haven't done anything that's big enough to have uh, warranted debugging them in such a way or I couldn't just use, uh, say, GDB. Oh, yeah, GDB. GDB is a nice tool for debugging your C programs. It can go, if you uh, compile your programs with the uh, G flag, your uh, program will become a lot bigger and contain a lot of debugging information that if so that if it were to um, crash and produced a core dump file, you could go and uh, run GDP, GDB on the core dump file in the program and get a trace of precisely where thing, of the trace of the function that led to your program's demise. You can also run GDB inside your, run your program with GDB and just 
and step through it, see what uh, see what it's, uh, where it's doing any funky behavior. You can print out values from the registers. You can print out values from uh, uh, variables. You can print pointers. You can attempt to dereference pointers and see that some of them are null or pointing off into space or they shouldn't. And you can also actually see us. We can also actually see assembly as it's being executed too. If uh, I think you can do that, I'd be surprised if you couldn't. If you if you wanted to, you could go and compile the assembly into uh, binary anyway using uh, that. No? Anything else? Uh, if not, I'll be. If there's anything, I'll be around all day today and a bit of tomorrow. If you have any questions or want to pick my brain. So. Yeah. <laughs>customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.